All right, let's check this out. Over the past year or two around the world, I don't have permission to react to this, so I'm doing evil things right now, but I'm going to react good. I'm not going to be AFK, so that makes it okay. Statues have been toppled and street names changed as decolonization has once again returned to the agenda. But for the past half century or so, the water has been muddied about colonialism by those who peddled the notion that we're somehow living in a post-colonial world. Communism this post-colonial theory gained currency in American and British universities in the 1970s and 1980s. Perhaps unsurprisingly, it was most popular among non-colonized intellectuals from the labor aristocracy of the imperialist course. But to accept this theory, we that's very much mischaracterizing post-colonial theory. I think post-colonial theory very much deals with still deals with questions of colonialism. I don't think it presupposes that colonialism is, is over at all. I think that's a mischaracterization, but let's see. We need to accept that those who bear the brunt of colonialism truly are post-colonial or after colonialism. That decolonization has already been I think post-colonial is more a call to action than literal, right? Like post-colonial as in like we should live in a post-colonial world doesn't necessarily mean that we are successfully completed. Acceptance of post-colonialism is just the denial of the new form of colonialism today, of neo-colonialism. Denial of the continuing colonial domination of the oppressed nations of the world. And the argument that this video is going to put forward is that this is a load to show you. That colonialism is alive and well today under a new guise. Its form has certainly changed, but its essence remains the same. Now, of course, old-style colonialism does still exist. The occupied six counties in Ireland remains a British colony. Palestine is colonized by Israel. French Guiana is a French colony. Guam is a US colony, and so on and so forth. But today we're going to focus primarily on the semi-colonies, or what some would call neo-colonies, which are nominally politically independent, but in reality completely dominated through a thousand- Hmm, I think arguing that liberated Ireland is a neo-colony still is um, gonna be hard to maintain, but let's see. In different ways by the imperialist powers. Crucially, as we'll see- I guess you could argue that it's like a colony of the EU or something, but generally colonialism doesn't go extremely well for the colonized people, so I'm not sure about that. Semi-colonies retain the colonial economic base of bureaucratic comprador capitalism that maintains their colonial subjugation indefinitely, even where full political independence has been achieved on paper. While this applies universally across the colonies and semi-colonies of the third world, particularly in Africa, Asia, and Latin America, this video will primarily use the semi-colonies through which colonial domination persists today. Now, first things first, it might be necessary to clarify the terminology being used to make sure we're all on the same page here, specifically regarding the terms colonialism, semi-colonialism, and neo-colonialism. Under old-style colonialism, colonies are openly under the control of one particular colonial power, facilitating super-exploitation, the loot and plunder of resources, control of the country's markets, and so on. Under new-style colonialism, or neo-colonialism, semi-colonies are covertly under the control of one or more colonial powers, achieving super-exploitation, loot and plunder of resources. I think, like, like, I understand what he's saying, but I think he, he leans too much into the Marxist terminology. I mean, I know it's a Marxist channel, obviously, but... If someone just happened upon this video, they would have trouble with some of these termino with some of these terms, right? ...and control of markets through various different hidden means. Like James super exploitation. I, did he, I don't think he explained super exploitation, but I think it's something that he would need to explain. But then we also run into the issue that bogging yourself down too much in explaining your terms becomes an issue. So he might have just been better off like simplifying it. James Connolly insightfully anticipated this phenomenon in 1897 when he criticised the moderate narrow nationalist conception of independence for Ireland, stating that If you remove the English army tomorrow and hoist the green flag over Dublin Castle, unless you set about the organisation of the Socialist Republic, your efforts would be in vain. England would still rule you. She would rule you through her capitalists, through her landlords, through her financiers, through the whole array of commercial and individualist institutions she has planted in this country and watered with the tears of our mothers and the blood of our martyrs. England would still rule you to your ruin, even while your lips offered hypocritical homage at the shrine of that freedom whose cause you had betrayed. Here, Connolly perfectly predicted the transition from old-style colonialism to new-style colonialism, from the colony to the semi-colony, from having a British flag flying over Dublin Castle and being openly ruled by explicitly British state forces like their army, to having an Irish flag flying over Dublin Castle and being covertly ruled through England's capitalists, landlords, financiers, and a whole array of commercial and individualist institutions. Which I guess, yeah, he's, he's probably going to present like statistics regarding land, English ownership and shit in Ireland that I probably don't know about are, in any case, all inextricably bound up with the English ruling class's own so, I'm not sure what happened when Ireland became independent. I don't think they appropriated anything, did they? ...apparatus. And importantly, Connolly states that England would still decisively rule us, just in a different, hidden form. In other words, Col I, I, I kind of disagree here, in one way. Like, yeah, James Colony was right in a broad sense, but I think it would be possible for, like, a, a generic capitalist Ireland 
to so, sort of decolonize, so to speak, via appropriations. But they probably didn't actually do that. They keep ownership of parliament buildings? That's hilarious. Wow, that's ridiculous. I didn't know that. Colonialism structures of economic exploitation were already firmly in place and would no longer require direct political rule in order to maintain. So nominal political independence may be granted. The Irish could wave the flag and pretend to have achieved freedom. Meanwhile, the very same colonial economic exploitation would continue behind the curtains. The very same colonial economic exploitation which generates political and cultural domination. And unfortunately, Connolly's predictions have been proven correct today, as the history of 100 years of the counter-revolutionary 26-county Irish Free State bears testament to. Despite grandiose narratives about the so-called War of Independence, the Free State known internationally as the Republic of Ireland has never been an independent territory. Where the occupied six counties known as Northern Ireland remains an old-style colony openly controlled by Britain, the 26 counties today is a new-style semi-colony that's covertly controlled by Britain and increasingly by other North American and European imperialist powers. As anticipated by Connolly, the Free State government still pays ground rent to its feudal landlord, the British state, mm. for the government buildings in Dublin, even for Dublin Castle itself. That's, that's, ludic that's very ludicrous. They should have appropriated that. I think they could have done it under capitalism, if they want pussies. Yes, you heard correctly, the ground rents of feudalism still exist in Ireland today. Over a quarter of a million of them, in fact, primarily benefiting British absentee landlords. The British state- Yeah, that, that's a problem. And another reason why appropriations or at least some form of mass, rep incredibly massive reparation that I can't even imagine how massive they would need to be are necessary. Obviously socialism would be better, but in lieu of that, if appropriations would be um, feasible, then yeah, get that shit in there. It itself also still directly owns major trade ports like Rosslare Harbour in the southeast, a hugely important strategic asset under an 1895 British statute. Okay, now and I understand better where he's coming from. This direct ownership of Ireland, its land, its assets and resources, isn't even getting into the question of British finance capital exports in the country. It's not getting into the British Royal Air Force's domination of Irish airspace. It's not getting into British domination of the Irish Sea and its resources. It's certainly not getting into the head of the Irish Free State Police Force's connections to MI5 and the British state apparatus. It's not getting into the conversation of cultural imperialism. It's not getting into the colonial titles of Dublin streets like Talbot Street, Westmoreland Street, etc. But even from this narrow snapshot, it's clear that Ireland remains thoroughly dominated by British imperialism. That the colonial exploitation and domination of this country remains, even in the 26 counties where nominal political independence has, we're told, already been achieved. That decolonization has never actually truly happened. These aren't just mere remnants of a colonial past that's been superseded as we've transitioned into post-colonialism, but instead symptoms of the neo-colonial present. You see, in the semi-colonies, the economic base of colonialism remains intact. And as we know, the economic base in the final instance is the- I'm gonna speed this up a bit, just so that you guys aren't too bored. Ultimate determining element in history, which generates its corresponding societal superstructure that in turn reinforces that base. Even the nominal political independence afforded by the Free State Project is ultimately shaped by this persisting colonial economic base as bureaucratic compradors who are in the pockets of imperialism have, since the counter-revolution's inception, governed the state. And this transition from old-style colonial domination to neo-colonial- He sounds like Mao, it's awesome. ...colonial domination isn't the exception but the rule. I've spoken here primarily about Ireland, but these persisting structures of colonialism that continue to economically subjugate are present in virtually all of the former old-style colonies that have achieved nominal political independence. We can see this crystal clearly in the French colonial taxes still imposed upon 14 African countries that were its former old-style colonies. This keeps these countries artificially poor by funneling wealth from the third world and into the first world, maintaining their colonial subjugation indefinitely despite their nominal political independence. And this mm -hmm. is par for the course with neo-colonialism, which has become the preferred form of colonial domination by imperialist powers since the latter half of the 20th century as it presents the illusion of independence and masks the true continued economic, political and cultural subjugation of these countries, which is an extremely effective way of preventing the kinds of armed uprisings that old-style colonialism often provoked. Now, the terms neo-colonialism and semi-colonialism have been more or less used interchangeably so far, but it's worth taking a moment to tease out the subtle differences between the two. In 1916's Imperialism, the Highest Stage of Capitalism, Lenin wrote of the semi-colonies that, as to the semi-colonial states, they provide an example of the transitional forms which are to be found in all spheres of nature and society. Finance capital is such a great, such a decisive, you might say, force in all economic and international relations, that it is capable of subjecting, and actually does subject, to itself even states enjoying the fullest political independence. So Lenin here outlines how finance capital in and of itself is able to decisively subjugate nations without the need for open political domination. However, Lenin wrote about semi-colonialism as a transitional form, either in the direction of full old-style colonialism or, less likely, full decolonization. But over the course of the 20th century, it became clear that semi-colonies could be frozen in this transitional form indefinitely, and that indeed this state was the most efficient form of colonialism. The recognition of this new form that imperialism was moving towards, based on the indefinite exploitation of semi-colonies rather than old-style colonies, led theorists like Kwame Nkrumah to famously label this stage as neo-colonialism, the last stage of imperialism. Now there are pros and cons to both terms, semi-colonialism and neo-colonialism. With semi-colonialism, the semi may indicate that it's only half-colonialism.
colonialism and not the full experience. This causes problems when we understand that the determining economic base of colonialism is present within semi-colonialism. Or, in other words, semi-colonialism is actually full colonialism under a different guise. Conversely, the problem with the term neo-colonialism is that neo may suggest that this form of colonialism is new, which it's not exactly. Semi-colonies have been around almost as long as old-style colonies. The only aspect that's new about this form of colonialism is that it's now the- That's true, but I- like, sometimes when I see the word neo, I take it as like, um, and like, not just to mean new, rather to mean like, modified or something, you know? preferred form of colonialism and division of the world enjoyed by the imperialist powers. Personally, only speaking for myself, I usually use the term semi-colonies to refer to the countries and the term neo-colonialism to refer to the period of time wherein semi-colonies have become the preferred form of territorial division and redivision of the world by the imperialist powers that came into being in the latter half of the 20th century. That being said, revolutionary theorists like Comrade Ajit from CPI Maoist used the terms neo-colony and semi-colony interchangeably to refer to the oppressed countries, as did Kwame Nkrumah, so you'll find a diversity of opinion on this matter. Let me know in the comments below which term you think encapsulates this phenomenon best. In any case, however you prefer to label it, the critical point is that in such cases the fundamental essence of colonial subjugation remains, and this opens up the pathway for potential national liberation struggles. Now, it was mentioned earlier that semi-colonies have the same economic base of old-style colonialism, at least the old-style colonies of the 19th and 20th century. The name of this base is bureaucratic capitalism, or bureaucratic comprador capitalism. Bureaucratic comprador capitalism is a capitalism born to two sick parents, imperialism and a backward native economic base, typically semi-feudalism. Bureaucratic comprador capitalism arose in the world through imperialist invest- I, I don't have much to add here, I feel like I'm- I'm not doing fair use anymore. Shit into backward economic systems, leading to the development of productive forces tied completely to both imperialism and native reactionary relations of production. In the age of capitalist imperialism, the imperialist powers themselves, served by native comprador exploiters, generate capitalism in the economically backward countries in order to serve their own imperialist interests. That is, to facilitate super-exploitation and siphon wealth from the third world into the first world and create- I'm, I'm kind of more interested in, um, generally, like, the, the, the bits about Ireland specifically interest me. Because I hadn't really thought about Ireland in terms of um, neo-colonialism before, but he he has certainly made a good case for it with the examples that he used. It's just that, like, um, I think Ireland um, today does benefit from colonialism. Ireland benefits from the capital flight of um, former colonies or third world countries because it's a it's a tax haven. It also does a lot of foreign direct investment. I'm not sure how much. I mean, I guess yeah. Since when I search for foreign direct investment, it's all about investment in Ireland rather than Ireland investing in other places, you could argue that that is a sign of um, the country being more of a, a colony than an exploiter itself. What about done by Ireland? So one trillion in Ireland, what about done by Ireland? Oh yeah, 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 foreign direct investment outward flows from negative 20 million? Oh yeah, yeah, sorry, I must have had um, incorrect information there. I remember seeing a chart about Ireland's um, outward foreign direct investment flows and it being used as a gotcha against uh, my friend Marxist Paul, actually, so I didn't know that. But, I mean, outward flows, 168 million. Yeah, I mean, this isn't... You definitely have incalculably more capital being exported to Ireland than being exported from Ireland, right? So that is definitely indicative, in my opinion, of um, neocolonialism. Sufficiency and genuine economic, political and cultural independence with a 32-county Socialist Republic of Ireland. So, as we can see, the concept of post-colonialism is a red herring that serves to perpetuate imperialist colonial domination. The colonies aren't post-anything. Old-style colonialism has simply changed form into neocolonialism in order to avoid provoking the violent uprisings of the national liberation struggles seen throughout the 20th century. Neocolonialism has also become dominant in order to facilitate the redivision of the world among the big capitalist imperialist powers. I do think it is kind of an interesting paradox though that, you know, by this definition and by my own definition, yeah, Ireland seems like a neocolony based off this, but Ireland is also very, has a very high living standard, right? So, um, that's very uncharacteristic of what you would expect of a neocolony, and I think it's very, or at least fairly, um, isolated in that outcome, so that's interesting. As countries about. like the United States have risen in power and influence globally, neocolonialism has proven itself a much more flexible, much less violent, read much more economically efficient, system in this regard as it presents the possibility for multiple imperialist powers to super-exploit and semi-colonize each of the oppressed nations simultaneously. Under neocolonialism, the defining colonial economic base of bureaucratic comprador capitalism remains intact indefinitely and reproduces the colonial superstructure, reflecting the balance of power among the imperialist nations. The only way to overcome this, to make the persistent colonial reality a thing of the past, is by moving beyond the position of dependency and pursuing a path of genuine national liberation and self-sufficiency under a socialist system. Now, there are a few texts that I recommend diving into in order to deep- I didn't read. I didn't like- But yeah, it's a different perspective on Ireland that I hadn't thought about before. I would like to see some, like, the question of like, do Irish people, does the Irish proletariat benefit from this arrangement? 
more so than people in other neo colonies do? And if so, why is that? You know, that's an interesting question to ask. But yeah, definitely learn something about English, um, essentially ownership of lots of Irish assets and shit that they still own just because they own them due to colonialism.